It's a real pleasure to be here and to just explore a little bit of what ministry with people with disabilities may look like. Um, but, and I think one of the things for me which is so important is while our, while we may need to adapt our programs and adapt the things we do to the different needs of people in our community. At a core level, ministry to people who are different to ourselves is simply Christian ministry. <laughs> and um, ministry to people who are different Invariably, it's not nice, clean ministry. It's messy. And the, I speak as a person with a disability. La, our lives can at times be messy. Um, and Therefore, I want to argue that ministry for people with, with and for people with disabilities can be messy ministry. And we need to be prepared for that. Um, and this is not a negative. Again, it is the ministry of the church. It is what we should be doing in reaching people in all our diversity. A couple of disclaimers first. First, messy ministry is hard ministry. It is, it is going to push us out of our comfort zones. To, to keep everything neat and organised and expected, to have things running smoothly, is uh, at one level, it's difficult to do the logistics, but it is nowhere near as difficult as including people who are really difficult, really different, sorry, and, and adapting as we go. But uh, there's a second disclaimer I want to make. What I am talking about in Messy Ministry is not ethically, and not ministry that is not ethically accountable. Um, and this is important because in our culture we have been hearing things about needing to accept people and their diversity. And while that's good, sometimes that gets confused with not taking ethical stands. And as a Christian, we need to do both. And I want to, in a way, bracket out those ethical issues and say, 
Yes, they are important, but I'm not addressing them here. But on the other side, I want to, to remind you that loving the other, that embracing the other, is actually just as much of an ethical call in our life as it is to say, I don't agree with your behaviour. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a challenge mm -hmm. to hold the two. And it's messy. Mm -hmm. it, it sometimes means that we need to walk the tough journey of being willing to say no but also finding a way to show that person the path to grace. Um, think about it this way. If you have a person in your congregation with a moderate disability, and it's hidden, and they've learned that bluff is a good way to survive. They've learned the telling a few lies and letting people assume that they are more able than they are is actually a good way to live. And you're preaching a sermon on the sermon on the mount. And you come to the passage of oaths and let your yes be yes and your no be no. Messy ministry would say, I'm going to preach that, but I'm also going to put things around this person so that they're reminded of the grace and the help of the Spirit to move through these issues. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and finally, just briefly, I'm going to look at the trajectories of the Old Testament. Um, and I acknowledge that there are some outlines, some things that don't quite fit the picture that I'm giving. Um, yet I think the big patterns that I'm showing are helpful. Um, I'm look at the Old Testament in terms of this theology of mess, starting from a good whole world. Um, we can move forward a slide. Starting from a good whole world that God created. And it is not a world of um, brokenness originally, but it is good. And that's been fallen, that's been disrupted. Mess and brokenness has fallen into this world. But God didn't leave it that way. Through Abraham, God made a covenant to bless the whole world through one nation. So God's vision is still inclusive, still for the whole world. And through this nation of Israel, God had his purpose. But while it is for the whole world, we do see an arrowing 
of the people that God is working with and who can be in relationship with God. And that mirrors even further to the Aaronic, the priesthood of Aaron. And only those who are ceremonial, ceremonially clean can participate in that priesthood. And finally, only one priest, once a year, can go into the most holy place and be where God is. So you've got this real narrowing. Oh, and though it's on behalf of the world, it's a real narrowing of who can be with God, who can be in His presence. And the overriding idea around this is the idea that God is a holy God. And it is in, and if we want to come into the presence of that holy God, we need to be holy. So you have this narrow of one holy person who has done a whole lot of ritual washings, a whole lot of sacrifices, a whole lot of stuff to make himself able to come into the presence of God. And it is in that context of holiness that we have this difficult passage in Leviticus mm -hmm. where people with disabilities are not able to access a holy place. They are um, in other parts of the Levitical code still able to participate in the uh, meals at the temple and that sort of thing. But they are not able to enter that clo the closest of relationships with God. And I don't want to say that there's an easy way to interpret this passage. It's tough. It takes a lot of thought. But what I want to say is the story of the Bible is not left there. The story of the Bible goes to Christ. And Christ is the one who became human for all. Um, and for people with disabilities, it's really important to plant ourselves on this reality. That, that Christ did what he did for us just as much as he did it for anybody else. He ministered to all people. He cared for all people in their mess. He didn't ask them to come out of their lives to come away to tidy themselves up before he would reach into their lives. He met them where they were. He died for all people. Amen. And he was resurrected for all people. 
and as the um, and he ascended to heaven, carrying the memory of his human life, his broken life. And that is an important theme in the book of Hebrews. That no matter who we are, we can come to God. Come to the throne room of grace and know that in Christ, God understands our experience because there's a way that he carries that memory with him <coughs> up there. And he will come again for all and resurrect us all and give us all new creation bodies. We have this hope. And, yeah, hope in Christ. So what does that look like for Christ, for the church? I want to take a moment to look at 1 Corinthians 12, 13 and 14 because I believe they give us a rubric, a way of thinking, of, of tackling this mess. But first, I think, one way of looking at the church is to see it as the community which, through the power, the personal presence and power of the Holy Spirit, the church is a community of promise for all. Yeah. Yeah. Now, let me unpack that a little bit. Um, I have deliberately included personal presence. Often, we, we can run into the um, situation where we start thinking about the gifts and the things that God does through the Spirit and kind of form into focusing on His power. And that is true. But He is a person. A person who is deeply involved in each of our lives, deeply involved in the community. And as a person, he will be working with each of us where we are. Um, and <coughs> therefore, we can expect that because we are each unique, his work with each of us will be unique. Um, but that work for each individual is in the, is in the context of the community. You can't separate off the work of the Spirit for the individual <coughs> from his work in the community. And finally, it is the community is the community of promise. Because all of the hope and dreams of restoration in the Old Testament are being realised in Christ through the Spirit 
in the community. That is why it's a community of promise that seeks to recognize how God is working now. Yet together long for when his work will be complete. Therefore, I am arguing, because the church is the community where Christ, where Christ through the Spirit is working with individuals where they are at, there will be diversity. There will be different people growing in different ways. Yeah. There will be this. But somehow we must find a way to work together yeah. um, to be ordered. And I think um, First Corinthians 14 has some hints at that. First Corinthians 12 talks of the Spirit personally gifting people. He, he gives some gifts to some and, and other gifts to others. And he gifts them for the good of the body. But this means that everyone is different because everyone comes in their uniqueness, their brokenness, their need to change and be changed by God. But within that, is the reality of the Spirit gifting them in unique ways. So, so we were having a conversation yeah. in the car about things not being more unique. Uh, I want to argue in this context, they're doubly unique. Unique because of our individuality and unique because of the way the Spirit works with us. Mm. Therefore, the church cannot, if it's a thriving church, be a place of uniformity. And therefore, we can't say to anybody that they're dispensable because the Spirit has gifted them in unique, special ways that the church has a community needs, even the weakest least honourable members. And Paul here <coughs> is actually being a little bit rude. He is saying the, pe the people you want to put away who you don't want seen are like the parts of the body that you don't want seen. And he is saying, actually, they're the ones you've got to look after. Because they are the ones who are gifted to yeah. and they have special things for the church. Yeah. But this is hard. This is not easy. So then you get 1 Corinthians 13. Um, and if you, about 10 days ago, Scott McKnight was at Laidlaw and he talked about love being rugged. 
and I love that idea of love being a rugged, covenantal commitment to be with, to advocate for, and to embrace the other. See, we, we do tremendous damage to First Corinthians 13 when we make it all beautiful mm. and all sweet and soothing. Mm. Paul is challenging the um, Corinthians church to rise above the division, to rise above the things that make them divide from each other to rise above struggling with the uniqueness. And the only way for Paul would do this is to put on love. And love in that context is actually hard work. It's patient. When the last thing you want to do is to be patient. It's kind when all you want to do is leave that person to their problems and not sit with them. Um, it's a ragged commitment to them. So for Paul, I want to suggest love is the foundation of how we do ministry in the mess. Love is at the heart of this theology of mess. Um, yeah. It's hard work. So, Paul, I believe, also recognised that the community is not simply a community that, um, that stays within itself. It is a community that is meant to be open, meant to be inviting people, and meant to be an evangelistic community. But he was aware that mess is scary. And from the outside, that can chase people away. Mm. And so he addresses this in 1 Corinthians 14. And he presents a two-sided solution, I think. On the one hand, he says, let the church come together in its messy diversity. Allow the different people with different gifts to participate in the church where they are at. But he also suggests that we design structures to create order, but do not stifle the mess, the gifts. So, and that's a challenge. And I'm not suggesting that I know how, but what I am suggesting is that good ministry of difference, ministry of diversity, can and should be well-designed ministry 
Well, to that ministry, we do thinking about what happens or what will happen when you include that person. It's about thinking about where does this gift fit in the whole bit. So it's order, but not stifling, and that's a reason. So what about disability? This is much broader than um, just disability. But I really think clean ministry, if we're aiming for perfection for neat, tidy churches, it is disrupted by disability and difficulty. Messy ministry makes space for those things. Mm. Therefore, I want to argue when a church is what it is meant to be, people with disabilities will be welcomed and feel welcome. Yes, you may need to do the work of redesigning a few things. But you will want to do that because doing that is doing what you should be doing anyway. So yeah, I'm leaving you a challenge. Design Missing Ministry 1. Well.